for a preacher to be offended that another preacher comes out and say if i have touched any woman the woman should cry out you need to know that we're in the last he was offended for that it means we're in the last days number one i will never apologize for my stand of holiness in the body of christ till my dying day so in our previous video pastor john anno sikeru booked arema sai for boasting to not have slept with any other woman except his wife and extending same challenge to other pastor yeah i have not done my man again i'm giving a challenge so you are that man before is the matter of what time because he has spoken arrogantly grace will be depleted mark my words it's a matter of time it might delay because he will hear it this part one now will come out and he will hear it and then he will fight not to go but he will because there's a way except he comes out publicly and apologizes something will be lifted from you in order to respond to Pastor John Anosike, Apostle Aaron Masai had to first of all establish a biblical ground for him to give response to such rebook by Pastor John Anosike. I have left the link to his explanation on the comment section, which you might need to check as we proceed into this video. Okay, let us begin the response. Uh, in, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 12, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. And Samuel said, unto all Israel, behold, I have hearkened unto your voice in all that ye said unto me and have made a king over you. And now behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-headed, and behold, my sons are with you and have walked before you from my childhood until this day. Behold, here am I, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind my eyes therewith? and I will restore it to you. This is Sam, the prophet Samuel. He was about to come to the end of his ministry. And he was compelled to do a strange thing. He brought himself under the scrutiny of the people that he judged by his calling as a prophet in the land. And he asked a few questions. Can we take inventory of the questions again? The, the, the question is, is this man doing this out of pride? Was it a sense of piety, a sense of sanctimony that was his motivation behind these questions that he was making bear before the children of Israel? Was it pride? His work with God in secret and in public has been an open book. And because he was sure of his integrity, he didn't consider it a threat for him to do this before the entire assembly. How many people can, that are preachers can come before their congregation and say, whose, whose daughter did I touch? You know what? I am sure of my integrity. And that's why I did this in South Africa. I said, hey, if there is any woman among you that I laid hand on, let the woman cry out. I found it from the life of Samuel. You are not fit for the pulpit if you are an extortioner. You use the grace and the office that God has made available to you as a means of escorting things from people. You are not fit for the pulpit. And in the words of Samuel, I want to ask if there is anybody in this immediate congregation or around the world for that matter that I extorted something from 
in the practice of ministry, that person too has liberty to cry out. The example that I have for this is Samuel in the Old Testament. I also have New Testament examples. For a preacher to be offended that another preacher comes out and says, if I have touched any woman, the woman should cry out. You need to know that we're in the last, he was offended for that. It means we're in the last days. We're in the last days where people will make effort to try to legitimize things that are outlawed. His offense was not that I touched a woman and I'm trying to hide it. His offense was that I have come to do what Samuel is doing because I'm sure of my integrity. Anointed, it makes you very, very attractive. I have had to deal with the pressure of attraction all these years till this time, and I'm saying that I touched no woman. Hallelujah. And meanwhile, I'm not saying this as a local champion. I have gone around the nations of the world. I know the difference between an Egyptian woman and an Ethiopian woman. May the Lord give you understanding. <laughs> the man asked, is there anyone that I oppressed in the administration? Of my office is there anyone that gave me a bribe in order to blind my eyes to facts do you realize that when this day of reckoning came Samuel did not talk about the volume and the weight of anointing that he stewarded the issue was based on character think about it are you there all right let me give you a support scripture Acts chapter 20, verse 33. Okay. Now let's begin from 32. It says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver. Huh nor gold, nor what? Apparent. I did not use the advantages of my office to extort. I did not use the advantages that were available to me on the account of the high calling to urge a man from his wife. He said, I have coveted no man's silver. Ah coveted no man's gold I have coveted no man's apparel the list goes on I have coveted no man's wife I have coveted no man's daughter are you there I was hoping I was thinking that the church of Jesus will celebrate that um, the culture of holiness is coming back and the integrity is being factored around the pulpit again. I never knew it would be an object of controversy for someone to present himself as an object of public scrutiny because he has a public ministry. I never thought that will be the basis of grievance. May the Lord help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, in order to finally clear your doubts, on the position of scriptures on this matter we need to go into the lecture notes of apostle paul the lecture notes he presented to his son in ministry giving him an insight into the qualifications of eldership eldership so the word elder and the word bishop in the bible are one and the same a bishop or an elder is someone that is given the responsibility of supervising souls a deacon, the office of the diaconate, is someone that is given the responsibility of administering kingdom affairs. If it has to do with administration, that is the office of the deacon. If it has to do with oversight of souls, it is touching the office of an elder. Are you there? Okay, come with me. Now, it says in verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, 
he desired a good work. If you check this scripture, you will see that the bishopric is not a title. According to scripture, it is a work. Second thing, he says in verse number two, he says, a bishop must be blameless. That's where I'm coming. A bishop, in order for you to qualify to oversee souls, you must be flawless in your character. People that have character issues are not recommended for the bishopric. Your relationship with Jesus Christ and your interfacing with the grace of God must be so rich that the grace of God flourishes and prospers in your life through your commitment to the Holy Ghost. In the fact that your character becomes reflective of a man that is truly regenerated. So we can trust you with dealings that have to do with the souls of men. I'd like you to understand that the requirement of bishopric is higher than what is needed for political office holding. Because this guy is dealing directly with the souls of men. And it is possible for him to, to command these stones, these lively stones, and make them bread. He can convert. You see, the authority and the office that he has gives him a lot of influence over the lives of men directly. He can be the reason why people will be turned to hell. His life can be the reason. So it is a very sensitive role. And in order for you to qualify to play that role, and I'd like you to go back and read from verse 1 to verse 12, the, the first requirement for eldership is that an elder must be flawless in character. That can only happen if Jesus Christ is your unique goal and the object of your pursuit. So this is scripture. What I did now is just scripture. So my response, therefore, to the brother that is watching out for me and he doesn't want me to enter into error, is this. Number one, I will never apologize for my stand of holiness in the body of Christ till my dying day. Second response is that your expectation about my fall, you will never see it in this lifetime. And the statement I've made is not drawn from a sense of personal strength, but an understanding of the covenant of God that makes the grace of God available. If God will not change, if the quality of the grace of God does not change, if my conviction and pursuit will not change, you will only see me born brighter and better. And I will be a more blazing example of the spirit of holiness in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I, that's my response. I just have to. I want to believe this is biblical enough. Uh, just like we have always remained and restated on this channel, God does not owe any man prophetic, apostolic, pastoral, or the job of an elder. If you will have to come into that place, then your character must be blameless. And if for any reason you are still struggling with sin, then the place of overseen people should not be your office. You can remain as a believer. You can remain as a floor member and keep trusting God for grace until you are able to overcome certain, certain sins and certain secret sin. If you must eventually mount the office of overseeing lives, destinies are there, people's life can be destroyed by, by your people's life can be destroyed by your mistakes. Then you must understand those character that St. Paul listed out for Timothy must be in your life. This is Sefan with the Potter's Media. I do want to know what you think concerning this video. And please make sure to leave your comments on the comment section. Till next time on our next video. I say bye.